So nice to see everyone here today. Not sure with the snow how that would affect things, but um, it's great to see some new faces here today and some familiar ones also. And um, very excited to get into this letter. Uh, my wife asked me what I was going to be teaching on. She was thankful that I wasn't doing another topical. Um, Sometimes top, topicals are needful. I believe it was last week, but it's always good to get into a book, go through it, get the full context and the full counsel of God. And so we begin First Peter, and we'll start with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into a, a little bit of an overview or a brief introduction of the letter. So please join me in a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the opportunity to gather. We are so, so blessed to still have this awesome privilege of gathering today. Gathering together in your name, Lord, still free of severe persecution, at least for now. Prepare us, God, for what lies ahead. For whatever it is you said, Jesus, that you will give us a peace that passes understanding. We believe that. Help us to hold on to your promises that are in your word, for your word is true. Holy Spirit, be the teacher today. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. Peter, who we all are familiar with, if you were to name from the original 12 apostles, usually even as a child, and on occasionally through the years, I've asked my children about the 12 apostles to name them. Usually Peter's one that's remembered. He's a pretty memorable guy. He did a lot of things that were memorable, and so he, along with Paul, who of course came after the original 12, are probably the two most well-renowned apostles. And interestingly enough, Peter's been referred to as the apostle of hope. John the apostle of love and Paul the apostle of faith. And I have to say I got that from J. Vernon McGee. I had never seen that before. But it made sense to me when I saw that Peter being the apostle of hope, because he's trying to give hope to a people that are under severe persecution scattered abroad, as you'll see when we get into the text, because of their newfound faith in Jesus Christ. And so he's writing to different groups of people, all from the Asia, Asia Minor area, and they are on the run, so to speak, from Nero and Domitian, the rulers of the time, who are blaming them for a fire that occurred. We'll get into that a little bit more. But Peter... Now, really, Pastor Peter, you will see a marvelous, miraculous transformation in this man's writing. Now, we know it's the Holy Spirit. In fact, in this letter, he's the one who says, when people ask me who wrote the Bible, man wrote the Bible, I agree with them. Man did write the Bible, but I will tell them they were men moved by the Holy Ghost. It was Peter that penned that. And so, you will see the transformation in Peter the vessel as this letter is written, because if you remember the Peter that walked with Jesus, he was a strong man. He was, if we're honest, somewhat of a prideful man. He was a younger man. He was a completely different man when he walked with Jesus. Now that Jesus is gone, and roughly 30 years after, this is written around 64 AD, you'll see in the writing through God the Holy Spirit that Peter is a transformed man. He's a man that now understands the grace of God. Why? Because he first received it when he walked with Jesus. But now he understands it because he's born again. And not only did he receive it and now comprehend it and understand it, now he's growing in it as he writes at the end of his second letter, Second Peter. And it's amazing to me as I read through both these letters that Peter, the man that sliced off the ear of Malchus, the man that told Jesus he would never deny him, but certainly did. The man that when Jesus offered to wash his feet, said, wash my whole body. Jesus said, it's not needful. This same man ends both his letters with grace. First Peter, when we get to it, probably won't be for a while. He ends with standing firm in the grace of God. The end of Second Peter, he ends with growing in the grace of God and knowledge of Jesus Christ. This is a changed man. Peter is not the same. If the old Peter, 
was writing this, certainly it would sound a bit different. The words would be different. But this is the evidence, the evidence of a transformed man. And you know, let me encourage you today, no one, there's one thing no one on this earth can ever take from you, and that's your testimony. No one can ever take your testimony. My children, a couple of my sons and I recently saw a documentary. I want to, I want to recommend it to you. Because I was so encouraged and challenged by it. It's the, the, the testimony of Jonathan Chow. If you haven't heard of him, he was a young man in his 20s. And he felt such a calling to go to the Sentinelese people, an unreached people. Uh, few have tried before. But he felt this burden. And he eventually went and he lost his life. But somehow his diary survived. I don't know how. But it's called The Mission. And what I got at the very end of this is this. Your testimony will far outlast your life. The testimony of your life will far outlast it. And Peter is evidence of that. This is a testimony of the grace of God. This is a testimony, this letter, of the hope, a lively hope, as Peter refers to, the, the lively hope we have in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This letter is a testimony. It's a living testimony of how God took a man and he transformed him from pride to humility, from strength to weakness, lost to found. And so let's begin in verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, of course, we know an apostle is a messenger, an ambassador, sent out one, the divine calling. Peter has been known also as the apostle to the Jews. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Again, five, five different areas mentioned here, but they're all in the same area of Asia Minor. And notice the verbiage, the words used here, strangers. Other versions say alien or pilgrim. The connotation is the same. He is telling his people... These persecuted, scattered abroad Christians, much like the book of James that we completed in 2023, calls them strangers. You and I are to be strangers, aliens to this world. We are called out, ecclesia, called out once from what? The world. If you are a born again child of God, you are called out from the world. You're in it but not of it. You're to live differently. We are to walk differently, talk differently. We are to be light, and we are to be salt. And so Peter, inspired, moved by God, the Holy Spirit, refers to these Christians as strangers in verse 1. Now we get into verse 2, and we'll go through this slowly since it's only seven verses, because there's a lot of important wording. Very wordy passage, the first seven verses, and very important words. The first one, elect. Now, this can cause somebody to wobble a bit. There's no way to get around that word, elect. Elect means you are chosen. Jesus told his disciples, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you in John chapter 15. To do what? To bear much fruit. God elects. God chooses. And somehow, some way, in his providence and his sovereignty of choosing, he also makes room for whosoever. As attested to in Romans chapter 10 and John chapter 3, which we just sang about, for God so loved the world that whosoever. I can't explain it. I can't figure it out. I'm happy I can't. No desire to. It's not my job. Never once has election hindered me from my burden, my urgency, 
to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can tell you that. I can stand before you and tell you that, that it has never been something that it hinders, has hindered me personal. That's its personal testimony of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone. My job, my part as a child of God, as a new believer, meaning new creation in Christ, is to get the message of hope, to get the good news of Jesus Christ out to as many as I can. When God puts those situations before me, to do that, and by the way, keeping that in mind, if you enjoyed the worship this morning, we, we have the gazebo reserved in town on June 29th, and Courtney and Joe and, and Grace and whoever else she, she elects, you get to elect the band members. Courtney will be performing at our uh, Follow the Cloud concert out there on June 29th. And so keep that in prayer. But the same way that someone can decide or choose who's part of their governing entity, their, their board, who's, who their employees are, God, God the Father chooses. That should not scare you. Why should it not scare you? Because he's an almighty sovereign God. And he also calls whosoever. There are two parallel lines that run together, never intersecting. Can I figure it out? No, I told you, I don't want to figure it out. I don't think we're supposed to figure it out. But what I do know is this. God doesn't want you to get scared by the doctrine of election. He wants you to get motivated. He wants you to get motivated to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. He says, elect according to the foreknowledge. Foreknowledge goes right along. Very simple apologetics for this. God is Alpha and Omega. He's beginning and the end. Of course he has foreknowledge of everything. God is not surprised that you're here today. God is not surprised by one thing that happens in your life. He's ordained it before the foundation of the world. You're just walking in it. God elects according to his foreknowledge of God the Father. And look at here, another apologetics point. Verse 2 is a beautiful picture of the Trinity. You know, there is a doctrine out there, United Pentecostal Church, I will tell you, that is the oneness only theology. It's not the same Jesus. Jesus is the second part of the Trinity. Jesus the Son, God the Father. The third part is the Holy Spirit. How many gods do we worship? One. We worship one God. But he exists in three persons, separate yet inseparable. Another thing, if we're honest, that can be difficult to explain, but must be explained to those who are following false teachings and strange doctrines that are going to ultimately lead them to eternal damnation. We see a picture here of the Trinity, God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, that's consecration, purification, hagiasmus, that's what that is, sanctification. It's the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us. I had a conversation this morning with a friend. We had a conversation regarding this. And if you're not being sanctified, if you're not being transformed, I would encourage you to do as the Apostle Paul encouraged others to do. Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. If you are the same person years later after you supposedly made some profession of faith, how can the God who made the heavens and the earth, the Holy Spirit who is purifying you, working in you actively, how are you the same? I would challenge you to examine yourself. Because the Holy Spirit purifies. He sanctifies. He consecrates. That's His work. To what? Unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ, if you look that up in this context, the sprinkling... Is the connotation of the purifying. Look at the beautiful work of the Trinity. Separate, yet inseparable. The Father elects, He chooses, you're selected. The foreknowledge, the prearrangement. The Holy Spirit sanctifies, He consecrates. The blood of Jesus Christ purifies, He cleanses. What a beautiful, beautiful picture. Three separate persons, one God. You've heard the illustration of the egg and water and all that, and you can use whichever one you want, but the bottom line is this is the truth. We serve the triune God, the almighty triune God. Verse 3, Blessed, oh how happy or divinely favored, be the God and Father 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant, overflowing, excessive mercy, not getting what you deserve, hath begotten us again. Begotten as brought into existence. Other versions will say born again. Same meaning, begotten. You were born in to the family of God. And Peter is bearing witness of this, of his own personal testimony, and encouraging those who are scattered abroad in these five areas that they were born again. They were born in to the family of God. Begotten us again through how? His overflowing, abundant mercy. His mercies are new every morning, the book of Lamentation tells us. Unto what? A lively hope. A living hope. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. You can, you can have your hope in the wrong object. You could be hoping in something else. You know what I've noticed most people hope in? That's the wrong thing to hope in? This might surprise you. Another person. You're hoping in your spouse? That's not a lively hope. It's not. And some of you, without saying it, you're thinking you're saying amen to that. It's not a lively hope. Your husband or wife is not a lively hope. Your children are not lively hope. Your mother, your father is not a lively hope. There's only one living object of your confidence if you're begotten in Christ. It's him. It's Jesus. He's the only one that is alive that can be the true hope. The blessed hope, it says in the book of Titus. That's the only hope. It's worth it. Anything else is just hope deferred and your heart's going to get sick. Your inner man's going to get sick. And I see this. I see this in Christians. I see it. You're hoping in something else. Jesus is there, but he's not the central focus of your life. You don't have a single eye. Your hope is really in something else. And right now, Pastor Peter is saying, keep your eyes on the lively hope. Hold on to them through the difficult times. See, it's easy when things are nice. But as soon as the temperature gets turned up a little bit, then we start to really see where we are with our walk with the Lord. A lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He conquered the grave. This is the hope that lives. The resurrected Christ, the chosen one, the Messiah, the one that fulfilled all the prophecies, the one that seated at the right hand of the Father, the one that's making intercession for you and I. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, and the list goes on and on. The good shepherd. The vine. Yahweh. To what? To an inheritance. Something that's given to you freely. It's left behind for you. This is an inheritance. What type of inheritance? An incorruptible one. Jesus said, don't lay your treasure up in heaven where moth and rust can corrupt. Any other inheritance can be corrupted. It can depreciate. It can be lost. In the twinkling of an eye, in the snap of a finger, it can be lost. Not this inheritance of eternal life, of the kingdom of heaven. It's incorruptible. It's undefiled. You know what that means? Completely holy and pure. Dow Jones doesn't affect it. Man doesn't affect it. You don't need a vault for it. You don't need a safe for it. No, it's undefiled. It's incorruptible. It's completely pure. This is the inheritance of those that know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior both. That walk with him. That are being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That were chosen by God the Father. That were purified Cleansed of their sin through the blood sacrifice we just remembered. Peter is getting this message of hope out to them. Hold on a second, let me pause. Let me pause for a minute. You know, anytime you bring up politics within the church, people start to get a little bit uncomfortable. But I want to bring you to the political arena of the context of the time. The following count was written by the Roman historian Tacitus, in his book Annals, published a few years after this event. This is the fire I referred to earlier. Tacitus was a young boy living in Rome during the time of the persecutions. And this is what Nero did. Therefore, to stop the rumor, 
that he, Emperor Nero, falsely charged with guilt and punished with the most fearful tortures the persons commonly called Christians. So there was this great fire, and the blame was given to the Christians, of course, when it really wasn't their fault. The persons commonly called Christians who were hated in general, in their very deaths, they were made the subjects of sport. They were covered with the hides of wild beasts and worried to death by dogs or nailed to crosses or set to fire. And when the day waned, burned to serve for the evening lights. Nero offered his own garden players for the spectacle and exhibited a game indiscriminately mingling with the common people in the dress of a charioteer or else standing in his chariot. For this cause, a feeling of compassion arose toward the sufferers, though guilty and deserving of exemplary capital punishment because they seemed not to be cut off for the public good, but were victims of the ferocity of one man. Innocent, brutal, ferocious, death, persecution to Christians during this time Peter is writing about. And this is what blows me away. This is what absolutely blows me away in 1 Peter, in 2 Peter, in 1 Timothy. It doesn't matter what it is. Domitian and Nero are never mentioned by the Holy Spirit. Ever. Never. Why? Because we have a lively hope. Where? There. In the kingdom of heaven. Not here. That's why. Because if Peter was really moved by God himself, the Holy Ghost, all that doesn't matter. All that fades away when you have a lively hope. It all fades away. Undefiled, incorruptible, doesn't fade away. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. Reservations for one. You ever go into the restaurant, they make you feel a little weird. Whenever you go to a restaurant by yourself, you're like, are you the only one? Sometimes like, yeah, it's just me. Oh, yeah, I'm waiting for a friend to come, right? But there's only reservations for one in heaven. You, you can't group a party. You can't go as a couple. There's reservations for one. There's a reservation for one. You know, I have a large family. There's others here with a large family. Guess what? Reservations for one only. You can't get in through your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your aunt, your uncle, Grandma Susie, Grandpa Jack, whatever it is, you can't come in. The reservation is for one. Peter speaking to the singular, to the individual. Who are those? Begotten. Born anew. Born again. Born from above. No grandparents, no step parents, no. Only one. You need to have that reservation. You need to make the reservation. You need to bow the knee of your heart. You need to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You need to believe by faith to get this inheritance that Peter is encouraging these believers with. Encouraging them, saying, Do you understand what you have? Do you understand the inheritance that you have? It's beyond millions, it's beyond billions. It won't fade away. It's eternal. That should be our hope. That should be our hope. Verse 5 says, Who are kept, who are kept by the power of God, how? Through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. See, it's God that will keep you. See, Peter's writing this, realizing this. First, it was Peter. With the sword. It was Peter with his mouth. It was Peter with his strength. Now he's writing, moved by God, the Holy Spirit. Really, I get it now, realizing I understand that it's God who keeps me. It's God who keeps me. It's not me. It's him. He keeps me. It's his strength, just like the Apostle Paul. It's not you. Our strength will never work. It's foolishness to God. It's made to be foolishness. Our wisdom, our strength has no power. None. None whatsoever. And Peter, what an awesome understanding and revelation to the Apostle Peter to get this. When the Holy Spirit comes, 
And now it's decades after walking with Jesus, yet he's closer to Jesus than he's ever been. He doesn't have the physical Jesus anymore, but he's closer to him than he's ever been. And he's not very far away from having his reservation met. In 2 Peter, we'll call it his reservation letter. He understands grace. Grace transforms people. It will transform you. Grace as a Christian should be our biggest motivator to leading a life that's holy and pleasing unto God. It's the grace of God that's received undeservedly, you see. Could you imagine Peter thinking back to all the times that Jesus was gracious toward him and the other disciples in the garden sleeping? Hey, stay here and pray. Comes back, they're sleeping. Guys, stay awake. Comes back, they're sleeping. Guys, stay awake. You couldn't stay awake for one hour? I mean, me or you, let's be honest, we would blast them. If we asked somebody to stay awake just for one hour and they kept on falling asleep, we would probably blast them. We'd get a little bit upset about it, but not gracious Jesus. See, he learned by example. Do you remember the washing of feet? When Jesus said, you're not going to understand what I'm doing right now. Why? Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. You're not, under, you're not going to understand it right now, but you will. This is when Peter understood it. This is when he understood it, that Jesus was leading by example to be gracious unto people, to wash the lowest servant's feet, the grimy, grubby feet, wash them, be a servant to others. Give them grace. That's what will transform. Give them grace. Don't hold grudges. Remember James, don't be bitter. Don't slander. Don't be envious. Forgive as you are forgiven. It was Peter that asked, but how often? How long do I, how many times do I have to forgive? 70 times 7 to the end of the age. Because that's how I have forgiven you. Being transformed into the image of Christ. Now listen to the next verse, two verses left. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Very wordy there, manifold. Now, I'm not going to go up to anybody. I'll be honest with you. I'm not going to tell them that they're going to go through manifold temptations because they'll say, what are you talking about? And I'm not discrediting the beautiful, wonderful King James Bible. I'm reading from it, by the way, okay? I love the King James Bible. But I'm not going to go up to somebody and say, you're going to go through manifold temptations. But what this does mean is various trials, okay? There, Peter's saying, Although for a season, I want you should greatly rejoice because this is just temporary because you have a reservation in heaven. So just for a season, if need be, you're in various trials, manifold temptations. Why? Some of you are asking why. You, you know you're going through some difficult trials. I mentioned the Spencer Pork is evil. And I've realized something as I pray by that gazebo. And I've said it before. I really believe this. Andy Griffith, the Andy Griffith show you see when you drive through Spencerport, Union Street Coffee House and the bridge and everybody looks happy. It's all just a facade. The people in Spencerport, New York have the same problems as the people do in the city, inner city of Rochester. They just paint a better picture. They're going through trials. Just like the person that's homeless. Oh, they may not be homeless, but they're going through some heart-wrenching trials. They're going through some really, really difficult things. They just paint a prettier picture on the outside. You're going through trials, Peter says. It's only going to be for a season. Rejoice in it. James said the same thing. Count it all joy when you enter into divers' temptations, various trials. Count it all joy. It's working patience in you. And now, Pastor Peter is saying, why, when the trial of your faith be being much more precious than of gold that perishes? You say, it doesn't feel that way because you're not rejoicing in it. You're not rejoicing in it. You're looking at it through the lens of the old Peter. You're trying to handle it in your own strength, and you'll never be able to rejoice in your own strength at something that is not natural for you to rejoice in. You have to seek things that are above. 
You have to be in the presence of Christ. Why? Because in your presence is fullness of joy. Though it be tried or tested with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. I found this. I'm going to give an assist to Jeanette. I believe it is. I'm going to give an assist to her today. Because I saw this on social media, and then I looked it up. I did some research on it. The beauty of choosing to be refined. This is an April 2016 article written by Jenna Lee Goodwin. The refiner's fire paints such a beautiful picture for us. You might have heard the story before about the woman who goes to a silversmith to watch the process of refining silver. As she watched the silversmith, he held a piece of silver over the fire and let it heat up. He explained that in refining silver, one needed to hold the silver in the middle of the fire where the flames were hottest as to burn away all the impurities. The woman thought about God holding us in such a hot spot. Then she thought again about the verse that says, He sits as a refiner and purifier of silver. Malachi 3.3. She asked the silversmith if he was true that he had to sit there, if it's true that he had to sit there in front of the fire the whole time the silver was being refined. The man answered that yes. He not only had to sit there holding the silver, but he had to keep his eyes on the silver the entire time it was in the fire. If the silver was left a moment too long in the flames, it would be destroyed. The woman was silent for a moment. Then she asked the silversmith, how do you know when the silver is fully refined? He smiled at her and answered, oh, that's easy. When I see my image in it. You see? It's all to conform you into the image of Jesus Christ. That's what our God does. He uses trials to conform you into his image for the praise and the honor and the glory of God. I've asked people this question. And actually, one has answered it right. And I tell them, please don't be embarrassed if you answer it wrong. I'll ask you the same question today. Don't answer it verbally. Answer it in your mind. What is the reason we share the gospel? Why do I share the gospel? Why do we share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people? And here's the answer you'll get, which is a good one. Well, so that people will get saved, so people will come to the kingdom of heaven. It's not the right answer. You preach the gospel so God is glorified. You preach the gospel so God receives the ultimate glory. The result is not up to you and I. The result is up to that almighty God. You preach the gospel for the glory and honor and praise of Jesus Christ. That's why. You go through trials to be conformed into his image. Because apart from it, it can't happen. Do you remember what Jesus told that church, Laodicean, which many feel we're in that time right now? Do you remember what he told them? He told them, you think, you say that you're rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. But you're wretched and you're naked and you're blind and you're poor. I'm going to counsel you. Buy of me gold, incorruptible, undefiled, doesn't fade away. Buy of me gold that's been tried in the fire. I've been crucified upside down. I've been beaten. I've had a crown of thorns put on my head. My side has been speared. I have been mocked. I have been reviled, but I reviled not. Like a sheep brought to a slaughter, I open not my mouth. That's the gold I want you to have if you call yourself Christian, little Christ. A servant's not above his master. You must go through the fire. You must. There's no other way for the refiner to hold you in his hand and mold you into his image to where you can see. Others can see Christ in you and me through the trials. We need to rejoice in them or by having our mind on him so he'll keep us in perfect peace as we trust in him, Isaiah 26, 3. This is the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine, I'll end with this, 
how different, as I mentioned at the beginning of this sermon, how different it would be if Peter wrote this while he was literally walking with Jesus, right? The prideful Peter, the powerful Peter. Pastor Peter had died to self before he wrote this letter. There are no signs of fighting in the flesh, no chopping off ears, no prideful statements. Just a shepherd, an elder. He calls himself a fellow elder in 2 Peter. An overseer that desired the flock of God to endure, to keep Jesus as the object of their confidence, to encourage them in their internal inheritance. Again, how different would this letter be with Peter, who walked with Jesus? Eye for an eye. Don't turn the other cheek. Slap him harder. This is probably how it would be with old Peter, the unregenerate Peter. How about this? Christian mafioso. They send your guy to the hospital, you send him to the morgue. That's probably what Peter would have said. That was an unconverted, unregenerate Peter. That was his power. That was his pride. That was this kingdom, not that kingdom. Jesus said, don't you think, Peter, I could call down 12 legions of angels if I wanted to? Why do you think I'm not? So you can die. So you can die to self. So you can have my power and my spirit, and you can be conformed into my image, and others will come into the kingdom of God because of your witness and your testimony. That's the purpose. Some of us are close to the reservation. You know that. The table's awaiting. You can even smell the aroma of the marriage supper of the Lamb. you got a table. You have a mansion. And, and I thought to myself, I never think about that stuff with heaven. I really don't. It's not so. I don't think about, well, how big will my mansion be or whatever that scene. I don't think about what the food will be like. I really don't. You know what I think about? I think about Jesus and the kingdom of heaven. That's it. Because he's the one, like we sang, that's worthy of it all, really. Undefiled, incorruptible, doesn't fade away. A reservation for you. If you have been begotten, if you are born again into the family of God by the blood of the Lamb. And if you are, God the Holy Spirit is purifying you right now, sanctifying you right now into his image. And the trial that you're going through, rejoice in it. Rejoice in it. Start praising God for it. Because ultimately, you're going to look more like him. People are going to be drawn to that. And then you can comfort them with the comfort that you've received when they go through their trial, as it says in Corinthians. As I've told you in the past, I can't comfort someone who has cancer. By God's grace, I haven't had cancer. I can't comfort you in that. I haven't been through that trial. I can't comfort somebody who's been through divorce. By God's grace, I haven't been divorced. But there's those out there who have been through some hot, fiery trials, and through it, they've been conformed into the image of Christ. And you need to sit down with them, and you need to speak to them, and you need to listen to them, and you need to cry with them. You need to weep with them. And you need to let the Holy Spirit just wash over you and sanctify you and work in you. Then you'll be able to rejoice in the trial. In Jesus' name. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. So often we're like Peter, the unregenerate Peter, Lord. Certainly I can attest to that. Father, forgive us for what we know now what we do when we act that way. But Holy Spirit, you make us aware. You convict us of sin. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Righteousness and judgment sanctifying us. Father, I pray for all those here who call Spencerport Bible Church their home. And even those that are visiting today, God, that you would bless them and keep them in the love and grace of God. The love and the grace of Jesus Christ. We're so thankful that we have an advocate, a healer, a Lord, a Savior. Father, I just end with this. I pray this over this flock here today. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Have a wonderful Sunday. God bless you.